Huntington Beach, a typical Southern California city. With its sometimes congested traffic, numerous gas stations, and plenty of people. But in the midst of the usual big city chaos, just a short drive away, there lies something special. As the sounds of night end, a new sort of sound emerges. Whether from lapping waters, calm air, the morning birds, it is one of peaceful tranquility. Over 1,200 acres, just 30 miles from downtown Los Angeles, one of California's last ecological reserves. Welcome to the Bolsa Chica Wetlands. rich in plants and animals. A place of beauty, of tranquility. A place popular with many people. especially bird watchers. Popular both above and below water. more than meets the eye. A wide variety of splendors, both natural and man-made. place with an extensive history
that sometimes clashes with the present. Our journey into the wetlands begins at the tidal inlet. For without the inlet, there would be no wetlands. For it was in the wee hours of August 24, 2006, that the wetlands changed forever. The first time in more than a century, water is flowing freely between the ocean and major section of the Bolsa Chica wetlands. Reporter Rick Milkey has more from Huntington Beach on the completion of the largest restoration project in Southern California. Their assignment might best be described as water under the bridge. Construction workers early Thursday finished clearing a seawater pathway under Pacific Coast Highway to the Bolsa Chica wetlands. Two years of restoration efforts at a cost of $147 million. A large turnout appeared for the opening, including members of the Amigos de Bolsa Chica, who helped spearhead the preservation of the wetlands and its restoration. My name is Margaret Carlberg. I was born and raised in Los Angeles County, Los Angeles and Claremont. I'm Dave Carlberg, also from Los Angeles, uh, went to school in UCLA. The Amigos de Bolsa Chica was uh, started in 1976 by Hunting Beach citizens who were concerned about the development of the Bolsa Chica wetlands. The Amigos de Bolsa Chica is a nonprofit organization that was incorporated in 1976 to protect 1,600 acres of degraded wetlands oil field operations and a massive marina residential area with 55,000 homes. And then we jump down to the reports of special events and then go down to committee reports. So they're not, we're not going into things that need to be going on. Our mission was, and still is, to advocate the preservation, restoration, and maintenance of the Bolsa Chica, to encourage public acquisition of the area to create a viable ecosystem. The uh, water was let in to the Bolsa Chica for the first time in 107 years. And we were there on the bridge with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and many, many, many others. It was quite a thrill uh, that morning of August 24th, uh, 2006. We had to get there about three o'clock in the morning to watch the skip loaders removing the last sandbar from the opening so that the water could come into the new, newly restored wetlands. And uh, then they had, we had to wait until high tide when the uh, water finally began to enter the uh, restored wetland. And uh, we uh, popped a couple of bottles of champagne, by the way, in order to celebrate. Let's thank the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the National Marine Fisheries Service, the State Lands Commission, and the host of other organizations and agencies that have brought this day to fruition. To Bolsa Chica, long may it live. Yay! The Amigos! 
we had uh, been looking forward to that for over 30 years. In fact, going back 30 years, we never realized that it would actually happen. We, in 1976, 77, when we first started, we weren't really sure whether we'd be successful or not, but we've persevered, and that, I think, is the secret of our success, is perseverance. Even many years before 1976, the wetlands already had a rich history. By the time the uh, restoration was finished in 2006, I began to collect material to put together a book on the history of the Bolsa Chica, which is here. And the title of it, which is the Bolsa Chica, it's history from prehistoric times to the present and what citizen involvement and perseverance can achieve. Now the history of Bolsa Chica, as I said, is quite fascinating. It goes back probably at least eight or 10, 9,000 years when the Native Americans had settled in the Mesa, which is now covered with houses. Archaeological site ORA 83, part of a network of sites, represents what once was an ancient village on the upper Bolsa Chica. But uh, one of the things about the Mesa Indian settlement were the artifacts that are still being discovered up there. There are, for example, most uh, predominantly something called cog stones, and these are, are round carved stone implements, the uh, use of which no one really knows what they, what they were used for. A wonderful place to see the Cogstones is at the Bowers Museum in Santa Ana. All in all, there have been over 1,000 cogged stones discovered in Bolsa Chica. Cogged stones are simply that, cog-shaped stones. They come in a great many varieties, but are essentially stones with cogs or ribs fashioned onto or into their sides. They don't show any wear, so they must have been some kind of religious uh, ceremonial device or maybe a game piece, but uh, hundreds and hundreds of them have been found up here in the Mesa. They are continually finding more and more artifacts. They're actually finding human remains up there as well of Native Americans who were buried there maybe thousands of years ago. And uh, we all consider this is a major archaeological site, but unfortunately the state and federal regulations are relatively weak, and so consequently the developers are still uh, putting houses up there on the archaeological site. there were at least 174 ancient human graves discovered. And all the while, construction was still going on. For years, the Bolsa Chica Land Trust, along with other concerned citizens, have been battling to save ORA 83. But so far, to no avail. When the white man came in 18th century, missionaries uh, entered the area and they uh, took over the uh, Native Americans and uh, renamed them Gabrielinos, even though they call themselves Tongva which means the uh, people of the earth. The Spanish missionaries referred to them as Gabrielinos because of the connection with the San Gabriel Mission, which was established up in San Gabriel, just north of here. Along with the establishment of the missions, 
much of the land was used to raise cattle for their hides. The 8,100-acre Rancho La Bolsa Chica was one of those cattle ranches, part of which included the Bolsa Chica wetland. Bolsa Chica meaning little bag in Spanish. Soon after California joined the United States, cattle raising began to decline, and the ranches were sold off for crop farming. By 1900, a group of businessmen wanted to use the area for duck hunting, so they purchased about 2,000 acres of Bolsa Chica and built a quite a plush gun club, a lodge, up on the mesa, which is right over here where these trees are. Only the foundations of the gun club can now be seen, and only from a distance through a fence. But in its day, it was one of the most prestigious gun clubs on the California coast. Formed in 1899 by founder and first president, Count Yasko von Schmidt, the gun club was built at Bolsa Chica because many of the birds that used the wetlands were highly regarded game birds. There are a number of uh, famous participants in the uh, gun club. Torrance, Sepulveda, Henry Huntington was one of them. Huntington Beach would get its name from Mr. Huntington. And as owner of the local trolley system, someone getting off at the gun club stop first needed a pass signed by him. And then there are also some pretty impressive guests uh, arriving there as well. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt was a guest there. It's been said that Babe Ruth was a, a guest there at one time. There are quite a long list of guests that were coming to the gun club. And then in 1920, oil was discovered in Huntington Beach, and the oil companies were certain that there was quite a bit of oil under the gun club. And so they went to the gun club and said, can we start drilling in wetlands? And after the 1930s depression and the crash of the 29 stock market, the gun club members thought that it would be more interesting to collect royalties than to, to shoot ducks. And so consequently, the oil company then were allowed to start drilling for oil. At the height of the oil boom, over 1,000 acres were used for drilling, mainly by the Signal Oil and Gas Company. The Bolsa Chica oil field turned out to be the richest oil field in California. Well, during the oil boom, of course, the place was just covered with oil wells there. There are oil wells on the, on the mesa up here. There are oil wells all through here. There are several hundred oil wells all through here. In fact, a few are still remaining uh, because of the fact that the state was unable to afford to buy all these oil wells out. And so the oil companies uh, were uh, refusing to give up a lot of these oil wells simply because of the fact that they were still getting oil out of them. And even outside the wetlands, you can still find oil rigs here and there, a reminder of a bygone era. but an era not that long ago. There were even oil rigs which once stood in areas like this residential community, as recently as 30 years ago. Now during the Second World War, when it was uh, clear that uh, risk for uh, the Japanese uh, to bombard the coast on here, in fact, they already had, I think, in Santa Barbara area, the uh, army had taken over the the uh, mesa here and began to establish artillery mounts 
up uh, on the Mesa. The Army acquired over 600 acres of Bolsa Chica from the gun club owners, who were evicted from their lodge, which was then turned into the site headquarters. There's still two Panama mounds. There's still two large concrete slabs that are up there over the overlook that were used to, uh, to put up uh, some 135 millimeter guns in order to protect the, the oil field and harbors. Indeed, if you let your imagination run wild, you can still visualize how a gun turret might have looked on one of the Panama mounts. Along with the uh, Panama mounts, of course, uh, this became a major coastal defense uh, outfit. And so the Army put in some massive bunkers on the mesas. The, uh, some of the bunkers had 16-foot thick walls in order to protect them from any possible bombardment. When the houses started to be building in here, most of those bunkers were taken out. There are still one or two still remaining in there, but most of them have now been removed. It's an interesting history in itself. Early on, there were a lot of uh, discussions as to what to do with the bunkers, because the Army simply left them behind. So somebody wanted to turn them into a, a nightclub. Somebody else wanted to turn them into a, a housing for homeless people. But eventually they were, they were turned down. But in the meantime, they were quite a magnet for the local kids. And in fact, sociologists were coming in, photographing all of the graffiti that uh, appearing on the walls inside the bunkers. So it became quite an educational center for a while for, for archaeologists. It could be glue. That they, that they... No, it's like rock. What's down this hall? Uh, nothing, it's just a pipes. Almost all my life in Huntington Beach and having been retired from teaching for a while, I uh, just enjoy looking at the, the open space, looking at the birds that are there. Um, and we appreciate the, the open space for, for the animals and for the people to enjoy looking at. One of the things that attracts me here is the open space. I mean, there aren't very many places around here that have the open space. The open space here is really one of the, the, the things that make Bolsa Chica so special. It doesn't look very much like a, an important wildlife area, but the fact of the matter is it's extremely rich and uh, it supplies uh, food for a number of wild animals, including ducks and shorebirds uh, and other wild animals. So uh, it, it's, a, it's an area that really is extremely valuable as a, as a wildlife area. The birds are certainly the most conspicuous animals that everyone sees in the Bolsa Chica, whether driving along the highway and seeing birds in the, uh, the mudflats, seeing all the shorebirds. Um, about a year ago, an international organization has proclaimed this area, the Bolsa Chica, to be part of the Orange County IBA, the Important Bird Area. Doesn't sound very fancy, but it is indeed recognized internationally. And we have visitors from all over the world that come here because of the diversity of birds, the easy access to, to see the birds, and the fact that there are many, so many uh, endangered species here. And that there are so many of the more rare birds that actually breed here in the Bolsa Chica. Seeing the hawks and the turkey vultures in the sky and all the ducks. It is truly a sanctuary for birds. Over 200 species can be spotted over a year's time, including pelicans, terns,
the migration from the south, from South America, brings all the terns. 40,000 terns nest here during the summertime. And great blue herons. And even different seasons, ducks and shorebirds migrate from the north, from Alaska and Canada. They come down in the wintertime. Some just are resting in their pathway to Central America, where it's even warmer. Others, of many different kinds, are here in the wintertime. Thousands of stingrays enjoy the bulls of Chica, coming in from the new inlet, not so much through the old part of the reserve. They enjoy the shallower area, and it certainly is one of the attractions that everybody looks for. And there are many other varieties of fish coexisting. About 80 species of fish inhabit the Southern California bays and estuaries, including top smelt and surf perch. Although most varieties of fish are found deep underwater, some can be seen from the surface such as anchovies and sea bass. And seeing the fish jumping, even occasional exotic creatures, like octopi, brown sea hares, crabs, and sharks. And lost mammals? A debate is underway over why a dolphin has been lingering in a waterway inside the Bolsa Chica wetlands instead of returning to the ocean. The dolphin entered through Huntington Harbor, which sits between the wetlands and the ocean. After a few days of being on the waterway, the dolphin attempted to leave, but a pod of four to five dolphins seemed to have scared the solo dolphin back, intimating an inferior male or a mating confrontation. You can also see other mammals on land, such as gophers, squirrels, and rabbits. There are coyote dens, and having this much open space, they have enjoyed the area so much that they are more coyotes. <laughs> and they, therefore, are foraging out in the community. And there are other land creatures, including lizards, snakes, snails, spiders, and insects. In a 1990 study, insects from nearly 200 species were collected at Bolsa Chica, including butterflies, beetles, 
as well as seven families of bees. In the Bolsa Chica, there is quite a diversity of plant life. There are coastal sage scrub, especially along the dunes and along the coast highway. There is a wide variety of flora. Some planted with the housing construction, such as cacti. Some old eucalyptus trees that have been here for decades. Palm trees by the old gun club. Some of them are 100 years old. And in the nesting areas, the yellow beach primrose and the pink sand verbena, plants that are very abundant in the, in the springtime, just beautiful. From sand dunes to salt marsh, to aromatic coastal sage scrub, to native grasslands, the reserve is a dynamic ecosystem with five major plant communities including 57 indigenous varieties. The plants in the water, the aquatic plants that the ducks feed on in the wintertime as habitat for various species and a lot of the invertebrates used for their habitat here in the Bolsa Chica. Uh, there are a couple of particular plants, cord grasses and pickleweed, that are essential for the endangered birds, the belling savanna sparrow and light-footed clapper rail. The salt grass and also the pickleweed, these plants have evolved to the point where they can tolerate salt water. And if you try to water your back lawn with salt water, of course it would die. In the case of the, of the pickleweed, it takes up the salt water and then deposits it in its stems. So these are two examples of adaptation in which these plants can survive in, in salt water. Hi, my name is Sharon. I'm, I'm a resident of Huntington Beach. We've lived in Huntington Beach for seven years now. I'm originally from Dearborn, Michigan, the Midwest. Uh, moved out here to be outside and a place where you could be out of doors more often. I probably come into the wetlands every day. The only time I don't come here is when it rains because it does get really muddy here and it's difficult to walk. But every evening I come out here and walk my dog. And then on the weekend we probably come out here twice a day to go for a walk. It's a great place to come and take your dog for a walk. So uh, we come out here, my dog and I, and she likes to watch it all. So we come out here um, at this bridge that we're at right now, and she likes to stand on top of it and look at the water and watch the birds and watch the fish underneath it. And people have sometimes walked by and looked at her like, what is she doing? And she just likes to look at the water and watch things. So I don't know what she's thinking in that brain of hers, but she does like to watch it all. So it's, it's very it's, it's interesting for me to watch her watch them. So it's, I get a twofold. I watch the ducks, and then I watch her watch the ducks. So. When I moved here, they were just in the final stages of the restoration. I think it's been very good to see the restoration get back to Mother Nature. There's so much building and that's artificial here. It's nice to see actually that's something that's Mother Nature and stays the same. See the area behind me where they were stored? because that was all just dry there and they opened up the water and let the water come back in there. So there's all kinds of life that came back and all kinds of life that's there now. So kind of interesting. One downside to it was is that they released mosquitoes that were dormant for many, many years, like 40 years. And you didn't think that 
Mosquitoes couldn't last that long, but when they released it and the salt water hit them, they all came alive and they sort of invaded this area, for the uh, residential area, and so we had mosquitoes that were just worse than I've ever had growing up in the Midwest. It was pretty bad, but they then have since gone away, so it was just sort of a month of that and then they were gone. My name is Hugh Tran. I've been living in Huntington Beach about five years. I migrated to you know, the United States of America in 1980, and I was from Vietnam. Through the contact with the customers who come in my stores and doing business, and we had talk, and then I learned that we have very important sites in Bosa Chica wetlands. One of my customers, he's a director of the nonprofit organization for the Bosa Chica wetlands. I helped her to design a brochure for her. That's how I came to know it. As a business owner, I support development. No, because without development, we are not who we are today. But however, we also have to consider creating a balance between nature and development because we cannot live without one without the other. So I believe development should be continued but we should never forget the history, the past. Whenever I have time uh, on the weekend and taking my kids out, you know, we come to see the you know, Bosa Chica wetlands. By having the children to interact with nature, to see the kid reaction so that we can see some animals, or bugs or spiders. I grew up in the countryside, so my childhood, I full of, you know, memories of fresh earth, the grass, the flowers, the birds, everything. So by coming back to wetlands, it makes me feel joyful. Established by community, business, government, and environmental leaders, the Conservancy runs the Bolsa Chica Interpretive Center. Which contains a number of educational displays explaining coastal wetlands ecology and history. You can even see the elusive barn owl, one of the rarer wetlands animals, among others. The Conservancy also conducts public tours of the wetlands, scientific investigations of various aspects of the wetland ecology, and restoration projects. The Conservancy and the Amigos de Bolsa Chica often participate in special events, such as the Huntington Beach Green Expo. David and Margaret Carlberg help with events such as this one, educating the public about the value of coastal wetlands. The Amigos de Bolsa Chica is doing quite a bit uh, currently. We have uh, several educational programs going on. We have something called uh, It's All Connected, which is an educational program to demonstrate to school children the connection between wetlands and the ocean. That uh, few people realize that the health of the ocean depends on wetlands, such as the Bolsa Chica. We also have a program called Coastal Wetlander. 
which involves having students go through an activity book and they fill out the activity book of questions and pictures and things of that nature and once they complete that then they're able to get a patch and a certificate indicating that they have acquired the knowledge that is necessary to become a so-called wetlander. Um, at least a number of times a month, I am here giving tours, either with school kids or with a, a friend. When school kids come, they certainly enjoy the birds of the many endangered species, and everything from the ants and to the little fuzzy caterpillars that are that we see in the springtime. From the very beginning, I've been involved with membership and secretary and helping with the docent education, training docents to give tours. All of the calcium, the phosphorus. The to this day, we have 10 or 12 new docents every year to help with our education programs. We also do work with the Department of Fish and Game and the other non-government organizations that are focusing on, that are helping the Bolsa Chica, so that we try to communicate with each other what's going on. Groups that do more research, other does more planting of plants up on the mesa, and we do the education. That is, I think, the major niche that Amigos de Bolsa Chica play in educating the visitors about this wonderful reserve that we have. Thank you very much for this opportunity to share a little of our history with the, the organization, the Amigos de Bolsa Chica, a group that has about a thousand members, some of whom have been involved for more than 30 years. We enjoy the opportunity of having an environment like this and sharing our passion for it. Thank you so much for bringing the Bolsa Chica to the public. This is a unique area. And more and more people should know about it, simply because it's so unique, so special, and so valuable as well. But it's so nice to come out here and actually see Mother Nature. I wish that more people would come out here and enjoy Mother Nature for what it is. It's a beautiful place to be. I'm so lucky to live so close to it, to be able to just walk here and be able to de-stress. So I really appreciate it. Even though, you know, we had to develop, nature provides us a lot of things. You know, the air we breathe, the land that we grow our food on, you know, the water we drink. But we should not forget that nature supports us. Indeed, under the inspiration of people like David and Margaret Carlberg, Sharon Sakura, and Hugh Tran, the future does look bright for the wetlands. A future where past and present are just as important and should be remembered. And as David mentions at the end of his book, it is perhaps too soon to claim a perfect victory for the Bolsa Chica wetland. But from all indications so far, for those few folks who began meeting in kitchens and living rooms during the 1970s, and for all those who followed, their hopes and dreams may be very close to fulfillment.